Um, thanks for the opportunity. We are uh, going to cover a couple topics, actually riffing on the historical bit a little bit. Um, we're very interested at Digital Globe in uh, architecting a better way to access data and coordinate data sets. Um, and we were very keen to understand how to do that uh, in the context of the OpenStreetMap um, environment. Um, and we'll go through really a two-part presentation here, uh, really talking about data sets and the advent of what we call persistence uh, in the environment today in terms of observations, overhead observations from space, UAVs, drones, et cetera. Um, and then the second half will be Josh talking about some of the tooling we've done to enable, enable beta workflows to take advantage of those technologies and uh, harness that in OpenStreetMap and how to, how to collect all that information and organize it. So um, I work in a, a little talked about part of Digital Globe where we're really focused on data orchestration, uh, data management, uh, leveraging our military grade uh, Earth observation data sets and using that as a organizing function for other data sets, uh, making sure that geospatial accuracy, uh, veracity, and the velocity of the data sets are all well stacked so that they're easier to use in applications like OSM and, and other environments. So um, that's my side of it. Uh, Josh comes from Radiant Solutions, uh, who's a, a group that we have out in Washington, DC. Um, they're a division of Maxar, which is our new uh, mother organization. We have four divisions, so Digital Globe now is part of a broader company. Radiant is really focused on a lot of um, mapping solutions for the U.S. government and other sectors. Uh, and all the neat stuff that they're doing is all tied to ID mainly. Um, and so he'll really emphasize that quite a bit. So welcome, Josh, when he comes online here. Um, so again, building on the time theme, uh, a, lot of, a lot of the mapping you see uh, in the OpenStreetMap environment um, with regard to the time dimension really has to do with two general things, either how quickly did the database build up. There are a lot of heat maps that show, you know, construction of new data sets added to the map over time, but very little done about uh, when that particular feature was observed on the ground. So a lot, of, a lot of work needs to be done on architecting a better way to monitor a feature over time and coordinate how that observation really needs to be tracked. Uh, and with these new sensors coming online, people talk about darkening of the skies. Um, we really took a lot of, a lot of interest in, in how to really architect all that. Uh, these are just two highlights of building permits uh, over uh, the city of New York. Uh, and people took historical building permit data, put that on a map, and the color coding really just shows you over time when these buildings were built. So that's really a, a retrospective on how the construction happened. Uh, our theory now is with sensors, uh, you can do that in a real-time basis and continue to update the map with, with date and time all on, a, on an ongoing basis. So why, why is this happening? So um, I've been at Digital Globe 17 years. I got there before we even had satellites. And the expansion of collectors that's out there and the expansion going forward is unbelievable. Um, Credit for this slide goes to SpaceX. I don't know if you saw the Elon Musk video from about three, four weeks ago, uh, where he talked about BFR. BFR is the big thing on the left here. Uh, the Atlas rocket, or the Saturn rocket on the, on the right, is the, uh, was the lunar missions. And so back in the 60s, we were launching people to space with Saturns. Um, Elon wants to send people to Mars with BFRs. And, my 10-year-old asked me, what does BFR stand for? And I said, well, what do you think? And she said, she said, big fat rocket. And I said, that's exactly what it is. So, um, so what's really cool about what's going on right now, and one, one of the reasons why there is such an explosion of satellites uh, coming online, small, medium, large, extra large, geostationary, et cetera, um, is really a, a direct function of the cost to launch those payloads into space. And the rule of thumb right now, and I'll show you a price list, there's actually price lists now out there, um, to launch a uh, payload and a, a vehicle out in the low Earth orbit, you're talking about 5,000 bucks a kilogram. Um, obviously, you have to have enough kilograms to make the payload interesting, uh, so that the bill adds up pretty quick. But, but those barriers are lowering very dramatically, and, and SpaceX, uh, with this BFR solution, uh, claims to be leading the charge on, on the cost of launching these payloads. So that's a pretty cool, pretty cool uh, initiative that's going on there. Uh, this is a price list from Space Flight Industries. Space Flight Industries is based in Seattle, uh, and they broker launches. So they go out there and find enough people interested in collaborating on the launch, 
They design how that, that stuff gets strapped together. They go lease volume on a rocket. They get the price up there and then they launch it. So they're, they're at a point right now where they, they see enough demand in the future that they're pre-booking rockets and adding those payloads uh, together and launching them into space. So there's a price list. Uh, you can call these guys up and reserve a spot. They'll help you with the integration and uh, off you go. Um, and then another company that's out there, a company called Worldview, two words, uh, out of Arizona, is, uh, is looking at stratolites. Stratolites uh, is a technology that flies in the stratosphere. Um, they're at about uh, 70,000, 80,000 feet, which is where the SR-71 flies or used to fly. And uh, you're at the edge of space. You're above airspace. You can go anywhere in the world. These guys have technologies to really maintain these, these, these balloons, essentially, or these stratolites over the ter territory you're looking at. And then they'll let you put any payload on top of that thing, whether you're looking at weather sensors or whether you want to image the ground. Uh, they'll do all that for you. So it's early stage for them. They're doing a lot of cool experiments. And we've been working with them on how to, art, how to leverage this technology in doing persistent mapping. Um, persistent mapping is kind of a new word uh, I'm throwing out here, um, but it's a place for us to go, I think, in the future where you get to, a, you'll get to an around-the-clock uh, observation paradigm where an ongoing basis, if things are changing on the ground, you could be sensing them and updating the database right away. So um, today, um, these constellations are basically observing the ground at 10.30 in the morning. Uh, with these payloads in the future, you'll be able to park one of these things over interdicted airspace or friendly airspace or the ocean, and whatever you're sensing, you'll be able to, to capt and, uh, capture and uh, send it out. So um, this is a cartoon that kind of shows that. Um, the higher you go, the more you can see on the ground, the lower to the ground you can see, the lower to the ground you are, the less you can see in your field of regard. So the optimal altitude is way up there, uh, you don't want to be in the space because that's very difficult to fly and build stuff for that. You don't want to be too low because there are winds and you don't see enough of the real estate. So the optimal altitude is what they've, they've tuned into it. Um, and they put a camera on there. They're working with a lot of different companies to put cameras on there. But one camera they put is their own. It's a, it's a DSLR camera. It's a red, green, blue um, commercial grade telescope. You put it down and they started taking pictures of it. And uh, we've been working with them to see how to turn that into a map. Um, this is a one square kilometer chip off that camera. The camera points down. This was taken a few weeks ago, um, actually a couple weeks ago over Arizona at 78,000 feet, and it's a JPEG. So our technologies are pretty cool. Our, our platform allows you to take any arbitrary JPEG, and the more you know about it, the better. But if all you know is the altitude and the time of the image and the rough area, we can correlate those pixels with what's on the ground and put a, put a coordinate on it. Uh, so using compute, uh, machine vision, uh, we can locate that data set in almost near real time, lower the cost of building these systems, and pump that out into the map. So between satellites, uh, commercial drones, and then these kinds of technologies, you can get to this, this persistent mapping paradigm pretty quick. Um, of course, automation's there. There's a lot of talks around here the past couple of days about um, extracting that information in real time. I'm not going to dwell on that, uh, but harnessing these images and very rapidly cranking out geometries is something we're also very excited about. So um, how do you map all that? So, so building a richer time component into the map is really critical. Right now, uh, there's information about when the feature was updated, uh, when it might have been modified, when it might have been created but nothing around the observation of that feature itself. So we've been collaborating with Josh's team who's been doing a lot of that stuff uh, in some of their government uh, domain and trying to see how the interface would work uh, for you to mine time information out of your data feed, the image data feed, and allow the operator in ID or JASM or anything to harvest that data and then pack it right into the feature itself so that you can now say, on Monday at 11.45, the river looked like this, and then at 11.46, it looked like that, On the next day, it looked like this. So uh, this is really the time dimension. We're calling it a space-time machine, uh, and what we're really interested in is the workflow on how to do that, and we took Houston as the example. Um, what's cool about that, if you have the time dimension, you can start inferring human activity from that data. 
uh, motivations about the change on the ground, uh, talking about the uh, historical map. It's a great scenario as well, uh, be able to track activities and why those activities are happening. And then you inject that into some predictive reasoning, and then you can start inferring what change might be like in the future as well. So very excited about the opportunity there too. Um, so again, historically, time has been something you, you map kind of in, in retrospective, and we're really trying to keep up with it in real time right now. Um, this is a great dashboard. This is Houston. Um, there's a time dimension on the bottom. If you're not familiar with this website, it's pretty cool. You can kind of arbitrarily box OSM, and it'll come back with some metrics on how, uh, how quickly the database was populated. Uh, and obviously, after the Houston floods, um, the, um, the mapping activity was quite intense here. Most recently, you can see that spike on the right. And so what we were interested in is drilling into that, that opportunity and see how persistent mapping would have, would have happened uh, in this environment had we had the data. Um, so essentially, this is a very simplistic topology to look at, but um, what we're trying to do is get to a place where a feature in look one is recorded if there's a change, you record that in look two. If there's another change, you record that in look three. So integrating the geometry itself and um, the modifications that were observed uh, on specific observation dates is really critical. So I'm gonna hand it off um, to Josh here, but we'll go over some of the tooling, some of the enrichment processes, and a general overview of the workflow, and then we'll kind of wrap it up with some, um, you know, what's next topics. Thanks. Just to adjust for height, there, that's better. Okay. Um, so what what have we done? I know we're running a little over. So um, we have OSM today. Then you have pre-imagery and and post-imagery data. Um, so looking specifically at the hurricane, um, thinking you know fall 2017 is our, our target zone. So what we are proposing, what we've done in a custom version of ID, is using image metadata tags. So. We were kind of inspired by ID version 2.3, which introduced this uh, vintages uh, in the background panel. We've used that before. Uh, and so specifically for Bing, as you're editing, you can pull up this background panel and we'll say, hey, this imagery was collected between 2015 and 2017. Um, it's also limited by what's being made available to you. So how can we enhance that? Uh, if you have a WMS or WMTS and a WFS that you can pair together, uh, you can add feature tags in the image category uh, based on that image metadata. So what we've done is we're taking a source imagery date, the sensor, and whether or not it's a mosaic, um, and you're adding that to the feature as you create it. So as you create a point, um, it's reaching down to the WFS, whether it's stored in memory or querying the service, and adding that to the feature. So now you say, this feature was created maybe on October 20th, 2017, but the imagery that it was created off of was from September of 2017. And so now as you're going in adding or updating features, you can have a contextual idea of the imagery that was used to, uh, to create that feature. So what we did for Houston, for this use case, was we took three WMS, WFS pairs um, in a custom version. Uh, so we added those to the data imagery JSON, if you're familiar with ID. So we have uh, pre-event imagery from 2013, 2016, and then also post-event imagery, uh, obviously, from 2017. So when ID is initialized, uh, the featured information is loaded into memory. You could also query it, and it's updated on the map, pan, and zoom. So we avoided doing a live demo because those never work. But we have a, a GIF. So this is uh, just loading the WFS information in the background. So the network tab up, and as we click through that, um, I'll load it into GeoJSON IO, um, which is a great tool. And so you'll see what it looks like on the back end um, and the attribution that's added to it. So if we scroll down, we'll see we have the early and late acquisition date. So we know it's a mosaic. And we also have the source information. And the more image metadata you have, the more you could add to it. We kind of took the bare bones just to start. And so this is feature creation and ID right now. So it's a, a mini golf course in Houston. I made the feature, and we're getting that, you know, the amenity tag of, of mini golf and the source being unknown. Now with image metadata tags, um, so we'll select the 2013 pre-event imagery. It will load. And so now we create that feature when we scroll down, you're gonna see that we now have source imagery um, earliest and latest date, since it's a mosaic, and then also um, the source, the sensor it was grabbed from. And as it scrolls through, we'll do it with 2016. This wasn't a mosaic, so you just get the one date. This was the day it was collected. And so now if someone went in after you because they're part of a mapping campaign, um, they see this point, they can say, hey, you know what? Was this before or after? Um, 
And obviously, if this is a flooded area, it makes more sense than a mini golf course, but it's kind of easier to, to work with. And so what we learned, um, and I will slowly transition off the mic and let Pierre kind of bring it home, but the long story short, that at least uh, we, we take uh, into this, is adding more context to the feature. And so now it's just as important to know when a feature was made as much as the source of the imagery that it was made from. Um, because you could have someone that's using imagery from 2012 and building, you know, building footprints. And then the hurricane comes through and, and those buildings are gone. And so how do, we, how do we have the most improved map, the most accurate map? And so being able to couple source information and feature information together kind of gives us that opportunity. So I know that I, that was the one minute, right? Yeah. All right. Well, almost. almost. Oh. So, um, yeah, I'd rather open it up if there are questions for, for either one of us and if Pierre, is there anything else you want to add? Okay. We've stunned them into, into silence. Let me, I'll throw oh. out a comment. Um, there's a bullet up here on the look geometry. So as these sensors come online, we talked a lot about ground level uh, imaging, but um, depending on the altitude that you have and the angle, with which you're looking at the location and the resolution of your sensor, um, an area we're interested in pursuing as well is um, the geometry of the, of the look of that feature. So imaging a, a building from the west or from the east could, could result in very dramatic, uh, dramatically different features. Uh, and then the time dimension, right? So there, there's local time, universal time, uh, time ranges, uh, how specific is the time, how certain are you of the time that you, you imaged it at. So uh, very rich uh, domain for us that could all get populating the database over time as well. Ideally, um, all this instrumentation is semi or fully automated um, over time and then, and then leaving more attribution to, to the operators uh, beyond that. Um, and I'll just leave the thanks slide. A lot of folks involved in this. Um, we, the, the post imagery was done with a technology called Dynamics, pretty cool. Um, a lot of participants in the project, so it's been great. Any questions? More? Um, uh, so if you're enabling anybody to be able to take high-res uh, local imagery, what about issues like, what about the issue of privacy? So we, we take imagery. Um, we have our own sensors, and we can integrate those sensors into this mapping process. Um, we, are, we have a licensing paradigm with the U.S. government that allows us to take these, um, these sensors up in space. Um, as we get uh, to a higher resolution, um, we make the data fairly open um, in general. Uh, it's a, a commercial-grade product. Um, we don't generally uh, personalize any of the data. It's a very, very static uh, you know, technology. Um, the attribution is really done by our customers or the, or the customer themselves that's buying the data. So uh, we don't uh, get too much involved in, in any kind of uh, personalization whatsoever. Um, fair concern. Uh, we're in the middle of that debate ourselves. Don't have all the answers. Well, I guess uh, 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 um, I, I, on that note, I was also wondering, uh, Keeping track of city planning issues, you know, I've been looking at um, minimum parking requirements and it would be nice to be able to determine how much parking uh, people actually need and it would be nice to be able to take that on a regular basis. Is that something you guys could enable? <laughs> Though that would... Yeah, um, uh, so these data sets as we organize them can really turn into time series um, and um, Today, most of the data feeds that are going into OSM are, are static base maps, and you can't really flick through time. You guys have done a lot of great work on, on being able to kind of flick through the time machine and go into the past and start correlating imaging events with other activities like traffic patterns. Um, we, we have services that can, that can expose date time, so that's, that's pretty straightforward to do. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much.